I entered the train carriage and immediately forgot why I was there. Welcome back, greeted a voice I'd never heard before. I turned to the direction of the voice and saw an unfamiliar man dressed like an old-timey train conductor. Although I was sure it was him who spoke, he didn't bother to look up from the newspaper he was reading to address me. Um, hi, I said awkwardly. Good day to you too, Joe, the train conductor said, his eyes still fixed on the newspaper. Joe? I asked. Is that my name? That's what I've been told, so it must be, the conductor said casually. Excuse me, but who told you? The guys who put you here, obviously. I took a moment to examine my surroundings. It looked like the interior of an old train from when trains were just invented. The walls and ceilings were all carved from wood. The windows were all covered up in red curtains, and every seat looked like it was made from comfy leather cushions. Where is this place exactly? Look outside and find out, said the conductor casually. I cautiously approached the nearest window and peeked past the curtain. I let out a scream and stumbled backwards the moment I saw what laid beyond it. The outside of the train was engulfed in red and orange flames, and within the fire, I could see the melting faces of people, their faces twisted in perpetual agony as the flames licked the flesh off their bones without killing them. What is this? I shouted. It's a giant lake of fire, the conductor said dryly. What do you think it is? I stared at him with an incredulous look on my face. Am... am I in hell? Not quite yet, the conductor replied. Please, you gotta get me out of here, I pleaded. I don't belong there. <laughs> That's what everyone there thinks, the conductor said. Isn't there a way out of here? I started to panic as realization dawned on me. I turned around to open the door I'd come in, with only to find it locked tight. Wrong door, buddy, the conductor said. For the first time, I saw him. He put his newspaper down and pointed down the hallway. Try that one. Is it a way out? I asked, hopefully. The conductor turned to look at me, and I was able to see his eyes for the first time. His eyes were pitch black pits, though... I could see the flicker of a flame somewhere deep inside him. Keep going in that direction, and never look back, the conductor said. And you'll forget all about everything that's happened here. You'll be able to start everything over from scratch again. Thank you for telling me, I stuttered. I'll get out of here and be a good person, I, I promise. You won't regret this. Thank you so much. You shouldn't be thanking me, said the conductor but you're welcome anyways. I opened the door out of the carriage and forced myself through. The fires outside burned my skin and clothes, but I pushed through the pain. For a torturous few minutes, I felt the flames scorch my flesh as I fumbled on the bridge between carriages to open the door. Finally, I managed to open the door to the next carriage and immediately collapsed inside. The door behind me mercifully slammed shut by itself and shielded me from any more fire. I laid there for what felt like minutes, waiting for the pain of my burns to subside. Just as the pain was beginning to dull, I heard a voice in the carriage call out to me. Tickets, please. I looked up and saw another train conductor, different from the one in the last carriage, glaring down at me with the same kind of soulless, empty black eyes. I, I'm sorry, but I don't have a ticket with me, I told him. No, the conductor retorted. I believe you do. He reached into his shirt pocket and took out a pair of scissors, the short, thick kind with a sharp, curved blade you see being used to cut tree branches. Confused, I picked the scissors up with one burnt hand and looked at the conductor. What am I supposed to do with this? The conductor tapped on his left pinky finger with his right index finger. Your ticket, please. My eyes widened when I realized what he was asking me to do. Y you can't be serious. I am, the conductor said solemnly. You must provide a ticket or be forced out of the train. 
I'm sure you know what that entails. The prospect of getting kicked out of the train and into the hellish fire outside pushed any hesitation out of my mind. I took the scissors and put my pinky finger in between the curved blades. I held my breath and quickly squeezed the blades close. The blades easily tore through my already burnt flesh and crunched through my bones. I screamed in pain until my vocal cords were hoarse. The conductor simply picked up my severed pinky from the floor and put it in his pocket. You may proceed, he told me, and you may keep the scissors. You will be needing them again. He wasn't kidding. I rushed to the next carriage, getting even more burns as I did, and was met with another conductor blocking the door to the next carriage. My heart dropped when I heard what he had to say. Tickets, please. Every carriage was the same. I'd get a taste of the hellfire outside for a split moment and be threatened to be thrown back outside if I didn't fork over another part of my body. The fingers on my left hand were the first to go. They only allowed me to keep three fingers on my right hand so that I could snip off my ears and toes for the conductor's tickets. After slicing off my nose to give to yet another conductor asking for a ticket, I wondered what else I could possibly cut off to give the conductors. I could think of a couple things, but I prayed that it wouldn't come to that. I pushed through the hellfire again and into the next carriage. I fell onto the carriage floor and looked up expecting to see another conductor. Instead, I was pleasantly surprised to find no one waiting for me there. I got up to my feet and was surprised to find that the toes I'd severed were suddenly back on my feet. I looked at my hands and realized that my fingers had somehow grown back as well. This is it, I thought. I could finally leave this place once and for all. I tossed the accursed scissors on the ground and ran to the exit. Outside, I found another carriage on the other side of the connecting bridge, but this time, the fires of hell didn't burn me as I walked past it this time. I grabbed the handle of the carriage door and pushed it open expecting to find earth or heaven on the other side. I entered the train carriage and immediately forgot why I was there. Welcome back, greeted a voice I'd never heard before. I turned to the direction of the voice and saw a man dressed like an old-timey train conductor. Hey guys, I see many of you commenting on my videos that this channel deserves 1 million subscribers. But I also see the percent of people who watch my videos aren't actually subscribed to the channel. So, if you like the content, want to support my channel, and want to see this channel reach 1 million subscribers, or maybe 500,000 subscribers, then go ahead, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. I used to work a normal office job at a small but profitable company. It wasn't a glamorous position by any means, but it was a decent living, and I still had it better than the interns at least. As an intermediate cog in the corporate machine, I'd sometimes be saddled with errands that were too important for interns, but not important enough for upper management to do themselves. One day I was ordered to bring some important documents to the topmost floor, the twelfth floor, for upper management to look through. I did what I was told and entered the company elevator with a folder full of files tucked under my arm. I watched the digital number display on my elevator slowly tick higher and higher as I got closer to my destination. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13? The elevator didn't stop at the floor I pressed. Instead, it passed it altogether to go to the floor above it which is pretty damn weird since last I checked the building only had 12 floors. The metal doors parted to reveal an empty office floor, dimly illuminated by flickering fluorescent lights that permeated the air with a constant buzzing sound. Black shadows stretched across the gray carpeted floors from empty cubicles that didn't even have computers on them. Strange, I thought. Did they add a new floor to the building without me knowing? Despite my better judgment, I stepped forward out of the elevator and into the strange office space that felt even more like purgatory than my own office. I was taken aback by the smell, or rather, the lack of it. 
We might not always notice it, but every public place usually has a mix of various smells. Stuff like the coffee sitting in an overworked employee's cubicle, the perfume of a female colleague, or even the smell of food left over on someone's breath after lunch break can all affect how a place smells. Yet standing there in the middle of the dark and empty office, I couldn't detect a single scent or hear a single thing aside from the buzzing of the light above me. Hello? I asked aloud, to no one in particular. Is anyone here? My voice seemed to echo off the drab white walls back to me, almost as if to mock me for asking such a thing when there was clearly no one around to hear me. Thoroughly creeped out, I turned around to get back into the elevator, just in time to see the metal door slam shut in my face with blinding speed, unlike the slow automated doors of most elevators. I instinctively reached out my hand to press down the button on the elevator panel, only to find that there was none. Starting to grow concerned, I tried to pry the elevator doors open with my fingers. It felt like the doors were fighting back against me as I did but I finally managed to create a tiny gap between the metal doors. I peeked inside the elevator with one eye, only to find complete darkness. No elevator, no elevator shaft, just complete and utter blackness. My heart nearly stopped when a single red bloodshot eye opened up from within the void to stare back at me. I let out a yelp and jumped back, allowing the elevator doors to slam shut again. I doubted I'd be able to pry it back open again, and after seeing the eye into my soul, I don't want to either. I would just have to find another way out of there. I walked past the empty cubicles of the office space, guided only by the flickering lights above me. My hands still clutched the paper folder I was supposed to be delivering to my supervisors, but something told me that my impatient bosses were the least of my worries at that point. At the very end of the office space was a doorless doorway that led into a long dark hallway covered in the same sterile white wallpaper and dull gray carpet. I walked down the hallway hoping to find some sort of exit. Occasionally, I find another doorless doorway at either side of the hall that led into another room that almost looked exactly like the office space I'd arrived in with only small variations like the shape of the cubicles or the type of chairs being used. I eventually came across a room that made me freeze in my tracks upon seeing what was inside. It was yet another office space, just like all the others, but it looked like it had just been hit by a hurricane. The cubicles were all strewn across the floors, the chairs and tables lay broken on the carpet, and even the white walls were cracked in some areas. I poked my head inside to get a better look. When I did, the scentless odor of the hallway gave way to a heavy metallic stench that shot through my nostrils. I resisted the urge to gag and squinted my eyes in the darkness to try and find where the smell was coming from. Sitting hunched over something in a dark corner was a humanoid figure with their back turned to me. Although I couldn't see the figure's face, I could tell that they were bone thin and clearly malnourished from the bits of their spine protruding from their naked back. The wet, squishy sound of someone chewing emanated from the figure, diluting the constant buzzing of the fluorescent lights above. Just as I was about to enter the room, the light above them flickered on for a split second, and in that moment, I saw what the figure was crouched over as well as the source of the metallic smell. An eviscerated corpse laid before them, its stagnant blood staining the gray carpet a dark shade of red. They were dressed in a formal suit like a typical office worker, not all too different from what I was wearing. Though, theirs were torn and stained with blood that poured from the giant gash in their torso. The emaciated figure was digging their bony hands inside the corpse's body and removing chunks of meat and organs. I felt my lunch bubble up from my stomach and was unable to keep it down. I vomited all over the floor, the former contents of my stomach splattering against the gray carpet with a loud splash. 
The creature immediately turned to me at the noise, and I was able to see its face for the first time. It looked vaguely human, with bloodshot sunken in eyes and stringy white hair that dangled from its balding scalp. He grinned at me with yellow blood-stained teeth. Fresh meat! It croaked before lunging at me. I dropped the paper folder I was holding and ran. Although my back was turned, I could clearly hear the sound of the creature's thundering footsteps on the carpet as it chased after me. I ran into another office room, pushing over chairs and tables as I passed in hopes of slowing down the creatures behind me. The room led to another office room through a doorway, which then led to several more almost identical rooms, with many doorways to rooms that looked no different from each other. I didn't have time to think about where I was going. I just ran into whatever room was closest to me, and hoped that the creature chasing me wouldn't choose the same one. Eventually, the sound of the creature chasing me ceased, and I was able to finally stop to catch my breath. I stood bent over with my hands on my knees as I panted for breath. When I finally regained my composure, I found myself in yet another office space with no idea where I was. It's been so long since then. I've lost track of how long I've been trapped here within these walls. I can't tell how many days or nights have passed, if day and night even existed in a place like this. I'm so hungry. Yet, I can't seem to die from starvation no matter how much I want to. I've lost so much weight that my bones are jutting out of my pallid skin. I've literally torn my hair out trying to find an exit, and what little of it left on my head has turned white from stress. Today, I was awoken from my sleep by a sound I hadn't heard in what felt like forever. A nervous hello that cut through the incessant buzz of the fluorescent light. It stirred me from my slumber, and I dragged my skeletal body towards its direction. I arrived at the doorway to an office space with an elevator at the very end of it. Though, I can't tell if it was the same one that brought me to this place. Shaking in their boots in front of the elevator was a woman wearing a suit not too different to the one I'd arrived with. As I leaned into the doorway to get a closer look, I became entranced by her scent. She smelled so sweet and delicate, so different from the scentless void I'd become accustomed to. My mouth watered as I inched closer to where she stood, unable to see me approaching in the dark. I was so hungry. I used to work as a live-in nanny for a rich family. The parents were away on business trips, so their two children would often be in my sole care for months on end. Unlike what snooty rich kids on countless TV shows would have you believe, the kids I cared for were very well behaved. They were twins, one girl and one boy. The boy was named James, while the girl was named Judy. They were both a bit quieter than most kids their age should be but I just chalked it up to them being introverts. One day, as I was cleaning the hallways of the mansion, I heard the two of them giggling in their bedroom. I didn't think much of it at the time and assumed they were probably just watching a funny video or something. Later that day, during dinner, I asked the twins what they were laughing about in their room. We were playing Mr. Yellowtooth, Judy said with a smile. He's always so funny, James added. I raised an eyebrow at their words, but quickly brushed it off. It wasn't uncommon for kids around their age to have imaginary friends, so it wasn't too unusual. I just never took them for the type to have one. He sounds like a nice fellow, I said, playing along. What's he like? He's really tall and thin, James said. Even his fingers are long, like noodles. But he's got a really big gray head to fit all of his yellow teeth, Judy added. They're all really pointy, too. When he smiles, you can see all of them in his mouth. He looks so funny when he smiles. I tried to imagine Mr. Yellowtooth in my head, but their description and the image that came to my mind was anything but funny. Still, I knew kids could be weird at some times. It's not my place to judge what their sense of humor deems funny or creepy. 
Later that day in the evening, I was cleaning the house after the kids had gone to bed when I heard a sound come from the basement. It was the twins' voice again. They were giggling with each other about something. I didn't leave alone this time, though. My employers, their parents, had told me not to go into the basement due to the issue with the structural integrity. I didn't want to get hurt or sick playing in there, so I opened the basement door and called their names. James? Judy? Are you two in there? The giggling abruptly stopped. When no one answered, I walked down the basement stairs. Each wooden step creaked under my weight. I thought that it would give way under me for a few moments, but I managed to reach the bottom of the stairs without issue. There I saw James and Judy standing with their hands behind their backs, their gaze fixed on the floor. Kids, I said calmly, what are you doing here? You know your parents don't want you in here for your own safety. I'm sorry, Miss Jenny, Judy said. It's just that Mr. Yellowtooth told us to come here and play. Yeah, James confirmed. He promised to let us visit his home if we come down to the basement. Well, Mr. Yellowtooth will just have to play by himself today, I told them. You two should be in bed by now anyways. But Mr. Yellowtooth will be mad if we don't play with him tonight, James said. He gets kind of scary when he's lonely, Judy added in a soft voice. Don't worry, I assured them. I'll talk to Mr. Yellowtooth myself now, so you two head straight to bed, okay? Okay, okay Miss Jenny. Jenny. I watched as the twins walked up the cricket stairs out of the basement. I couldn't help but smile. They were a little odd, but they were good kids. If I ever had my own, I'd want them to be like James and Judy. Once they left the basement, I pulled out my phone and started scrolling. I'd planned to stay there for about a minute to sell the illusion that I was talking to their imaginary friend. But just as I was about to leave, I heard a creak come from somewhere within the dark basement. I used the light on my phone screen to illuminate the area. To my surprise, I saw a trap door right in the middle of the basement that I could have sworn wasn't there before. My curiosity won over, and I approached the trap door. As soon as I got near to it, the trap door popped open, and a long, gray arm with dirty yellowed nails sprung from it to grab my ankle. I didn't have time to react and could only muster a shill scream as it dragged me inside the trap door. I felt my back hit something hard like wood, but I looked up to see what had grabbed me. I saw what the twins had described earlier that day. It was Mr. Yellowtooth, though he was a thousand times more grotesque than I'd imagined him. His body and limbs were stick thin, so much that it should have been impossible for him to have any organs. And yet, he had a disproportionately bulbous head that his scrawny body shouldn't have been able to support. I screamed and kicked him hard in his bony shin. Surprisingly, it worked, and he toppled over onto the ground. His grip on my ankle released as he struggled to bring himself back up, and I made a run for it. I was in a large house that looked exactly like the one I'd just left, but the walls were dirty and covered in reddish-brown stains that gave off a stale, coppery stench. I ran past where the kitchen should be, hoping to find some sort of knife to defend myself with. I found one lying on an empty cutting board beside a boiling pot on the stove, though there were no ingredients around to cook with. After grabbing the knife, I turned around and waited beside the open doorway to the kitchen for Mr. Yellowtooth to walk in. As soon as he scuttered into the kitchen to look for me, I brought the knife down on his oversized head. He turned his head towards me just in time for the blade of the knife to bury itself in his left eye. The inhuman thing let out a loud scream of agony, though the smile never left his face. I let go of the knife handle and pushed past him out of the kitchen while he was busy trying to get it out of his eye. I ran to where the twins' bedroom should have been and locked the door behind me. It looked almost exactly like the twins' actual room in the real house, albeit a lot dirtier. In my panic, I scrambled into the wardrobe to hide. I stuffed myself in and closed the door. I leaned back in the wardrobe hoping to make myself scarce. The moment I did, 
the wooden panel behind me gave way, and I fell backwards. For the second time that day, I felt my back hit a hard wooden floor. But I wasn't in that dirty house anymore. I was looking up at the familiar ceiling of the twins' bedroom, and when I turned my gaze to look at where I'd fallen through, I merely saw their open wardrobe. Miss Jenny? I heard Judy say within the room. She sat up on her bed and rubbed her eyes before looking at me with confusion on her face. What are you doing here? What did Mr. Yellowtooth say? I still work as a nanny in that house, though the twins have thankfully stopped talking about Mr. Yellowtooth. I guessed I must have left quite an impression with the knife to his eyeball. Every now and then I'd still hear scratching coming from the basement, but I kept it locked up at all times and put the keys somewhere the twins can't reach. A part of me knows I should be afraid, but after a couple of restless nights, I've come to realize that they were probably a reason why Mr. Yellowtooth was targeting the kids, because he can't target anyone else. I guess that's what monsters really are in the end. Cowards who pick on those who are weaker than them to make themselves feel stronger. Supernatural monster or not, I'm never letting Mr. Yellowtooth get near my twins ever again.